and welcome to day two of Museums and Tech 2021. I'm Sarah Middle, I'm the MCG Secretary and Programme Chair for Muse Tech 2021 and I'm also a postdoctoral researcher on the Tools of Knowledge project at National Museums Scotland as well as a PhD candidate at the Open University. I hope those of you who attended yesterday enjoyed the presentations given by our brilliant speakers and that you went away inspired by all the creative uses of data in different contexts and for different purposes. Before we start, I have a few reminders about housekeeping things. Talks will be captioned live by our partners um, Stage Text and My Clear Text. Uh, we recommend that you open the caption stream in a separate window that you can view alongside the presentation and all presentations will happen in the stage area. We have various networking options available today. Um, our queue for coffee is a text only chat and there's also a queue for cake, which is text and video chat. Both of these will run throughout the conference, including the break and networking session and can be accessed from the sessions tab in the left hand menu. We'll also have a short lunchtime networking session after the conference officially ends at 1.15. If you're feeling brave, uh, the networking space, which you can find in the left hand menu, will be open during the break and networking session. This space randomly matches you with another attendee for three minute speed networking. Otherwise, you can browse the attendees list in the people tab and send direct messages or invite people to video chat. We also have our AGM happening at the same time as the networking session at 11.50. So please do come along if you'd like to find out more about how the MCG works. Please tweet about the conference using the hashtag MuseTech2021 and follow us at UKMCG. While interacting with others at the conference or on social media, please remember that this is a safe space and to abide by our code of conduct at all times. If you need to report someone for inappropriate behaviour, you can do this by finding their profile in the People tab and clicking the three dots in the top right hand corner, or you can send Sarah Cole a direct message. Uh, please also contact Sarah if you have any technical issues. We had some really great contributions in the chat during yesterday's sessions, so thank you to everyone for contributing. If you have any questions or comments during the talk, please post them in the stage chat rather than the general event chat, um, because otherwise, due to the technical vagaries of Hopin, the session chair won't be able to see them and your question might not get asked. Um, throughout today's session, please also keep an eye on the event-wide chat tab as we'll use this for any announcements. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of speakers for you today with presentation sessions on collections and infrastructures. But first, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Rebecca Bailey. Rebecca M. Bailey is currently Programme Director of the £19 million Research Funding Programme towards a National Collection. She's assigned to the programme full time for five years, 2020 to 2025, by Historic Environment Scotland, where she's worked since 2004. <coughs> Her most recent role was Head of Exhibitions and Outreach. In addition to coordinating research funding and a PhD programme, she initiated a series of touring exhibitions in museums, <coughs> excuse me, um, and historic properties throughout Scotland as well as curating two substantial exhibitions in Nanjing Museum in China. She was principal investigator of the related international research project producing Consuming Romantic Scotland. She's currently president of the International Confederation of Architectural Museums and an advisory council member of the International Council of Museums. Rebecca's talk today is titled Connecting Data Through Towards a National Collection. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. I'm joining you from a very uh, chilly Edinburgh, just outside Edinburgh. It's a beautiful day but freezing. Um, so I'm very pleased to uh, kind of run you through the Towards a National Collection programme today and then take some sort of dives into some of the parts of it that are at a more advanced stage. But to kind of warm us up and wake you up, I'm uh, going to start by showing a short animation and hopefully I have the sound on for this. Wait, just a moment, I'm getting a delay. Okay, I'll try that again. Okay. 
I'm getting a big delay in changing my slides. Creativity and culture. It's always had the power to bring us together by entering our hearts, challenging our perspectives. But we've never had the ability to bring it all together. Let it mingle. Get to know each other. History has contrived to keep our masterpieces and artifacts apart. Maybe it's time to see what happens when they come together. Maybe they're connected in ways we don't even know about yet. Because all our separate collections are also one single collection. Our national collection. And we should all have access to it. To unlock its power, its beauty, and its secrets. Shining a light on the connections between collections and their influence. That's what we're working towards. Unlimited access in a virtual world. So, watch this space. We're moving towards a national collection. Okay. So that's the aspiration for what we're trying to do. But the Towards a National Collection program itself is supporting research that breaks down the barriers that exist between the UK's outstanding cultural heritage collections. And our aim is to open them up to new research opportunities and to encourage the public to explore them in new ways. The term national collection is not designed to be a loaded term, although it has slightly become that. And for the program, it simply represents the breadth and range of culture and heritage collections across the UK. In terms of funding, we have 18.9 million pounds of strategic priorities funding to spend over five years. We started in February 2020 and complete in January 25. And that funding is delivered through UK research and innovation through the Arts and Humanities Research Council. We've already awarded all of our grant funding, and that's over three phases, eight foundation projects, three COVID-19 projects, and five discovery projects. And I'll go through those. And the programme itself is led and coordinated by a small programme directorate based at Historic Environment Scotland, and we are an independent research organisation of the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So our eight foundation projects, as the name suggests, are designed to explore some of the tools, methods, issues that would underpin the building of a national collection. They're all led by independent research organisations. Some of them are looking at uh, standards that are already in existence, but could be better applied across our sector. So they, they include the National Galleries Project on IIIF and the British Library Project on Persistent Identifiers. Others are looking at particular kind of ways of searching collections. So um, we have the National Archives Deep Discoveries uh, looking at pattern recognition. That's the first project to have finished. And the British Library, looking at geolocation as a way of linking data. Um, that's got, that one's got a little while to run yet. Science Museum Group have been delving right into the use of AI and um, machine learning to link together messy data at a substantial scale. And I think there's been quite a lot of interest in that project already. The V&A are exploring the different issues that occur through born digital records. National Archives looking at crowdsourcing and take, taking quite a different approach um, and looking at the problematic language that we have inherited in many of our collection catalogues and how to deal with that. Um, so all of the projects bar one are still underway. They're finishing over the next six months. There are interim reports available on all of them on our website, nationalcollection.org.uk. And they'll all be producing final reports. The, what, the pattern recognition project that's finished, that report will be published shortly. With the pandemic, we uh, went with the rest of UKRI and issued a special call for projects related to how collections 
were being used in lockdown or pre-lockdown, during lockdown, post-lockdown, we hoped at the time, we just about got there. Um, and we've got three projects there. The first, um, led by Strathclyde University, Digital Footprints and Search Pathways. I'm going to show you a slide from that later. That's sort of delving into the uh, user logs of collections across the two national collections, National Museum Scotland and National Gallery Scotland, to understand uh, the, the changes in user behaviour. Um, Durham University have worked with the Liverpool Biennial on a very different project, looking at machine curation and trying to do a comparison between um, virtual exhibition and physical exhibition. That, that one's finished, the report will be published very shortly. And very different again, the University of York has been working with very um, small collections, trying to understand the digital capacity of smaller collections and also their kind of appetite for how they want to be sharing their collections uh, virtually. And that project um, has basically been supporting eight different collections to develop their skills capacity and to understand better what the challenges of that uh, sector are. That one's also complete with its report coming very shortly. But the biggest part of our funding has very recently been awarded to five large scale discovery projects. These have each received about £2.9 million and have three years. And over that period, they will each be carrying out world class interdisciplinary research, growing and diversifying audiences by introducing the public to new ways of engaging with collections. They're going to be devising technological and organisational solutions to the barriers between online collections. And they're aimed to deliver benefit to collections of varied scale and geographic location. And looking forward, they're about creating a sound evidence base for the future development of a UK digital collections research infrastructure. And I'll come back to that in terms of how we're taking that forward. Across the five projects, uh, we're very pleased to have 15 universities, 63 heritage organisations and more than 120 researchers. And across those teams, they're based right across the four home nations of the UK. So the first of those projects, I should say they've all just started. Some of them started in October, some of them started a week or so ago. So they're very fresh, they're very much at set up stage. Hopefully some of you have seen the recruitment they've been doing. Um, and please, there will be more recruitment over the next few months. And we're very, very interested in getting the very best candidates. So do keep an eye on our website for the opportunities as they come up. Um, so the Science Museum group is leading a project called the Congruence Engine. This is focusing on industrial history and particularly on textiles, energy and communications. And it's going to be using an action research methodology to work with both curators and interested members of the public to develop ways of searching across those collections and developing ways of researching with the idea that there'll be iterative development um, of the technical side of it, responding to user need throughout the period. Unpath Waters, very different, led by Historic England. This is looking to find ways of bringing together the marine and maritime collections in the UK. I've got a slide on this in a minute to show you some of the data, so I'll not say more. The Sloan Lab, many, many of you will know Sir Hans Sloan's collection. Um, formed the founding collection of the British Museum and then was later dispersed between the British Museum, the Natural History Museum and the British Library. And so this project is looking about how it can be reunited digitally and how that can open up uh, new avenues of research. Um, there's obviously some uh, challenging elements of the history of that collection and they will be looking to um, tackle them head on in the research and to encourage uh, a series of community fellowships exploring the collections in um, different ways. And half of those fellowships, about five of them, are going to be reserved for people of colour and people from the Global South. Um, University of the Arts London is leading Transforming Collections. This is looking 
to um, identify, connect and foreground um, artworks that are currently in public collections, very dispersed um, across the UK, created by people of colour and using AI to try and investigate how bias can be foregrounded within catalogues and then how we address it. Um, that's going to involve some artist commissions as well to look at interpreting uh, what we find, possibly even interpreting the process of what AI has been able to do. Um, and a lot of that public outreach will take place in the partner at Tate. The final of the five projects, Our Heritage, Our Stories, is led by the University of Glasgow, and that's looking at community generated digital content and how that's endangered, um, fragile, highly dispersed, and how to actually bring that together. They're going to be working very closely with the National Archives and trying to create an observatory at the National Archives that brings this data together and allows you to search it alongside other kinds of archive collections. So in terms of data, I've just got a couple of slides picked from a couple of the projects to give you an idea of the massive diversity of the data that this project, this programme overall um, is addressing within its projects. So this first slide is from uh, the COVID-19 project, Digital Footprints and Search Pathways. Don't expect you to be able to read this on your little laptop screen, but it's basically um, to show how the user logs of the National Museums of Scotland and the National Galleries of Scotland have been interrogated to see how users wanted to view collections. And the comparison here is the different periods of pre-pandemic, during pandemic lockdown and um, a little bit uh, post. So they're still working on this, but this is a slide uh, they, they presented at something else recently, so I grabbed it. Um, and so we'll be getting a bit uh, deeper analysis of this as to what it means. But the headline is, unsurprisingly, that collection views were higher during lockdown for both organisations. Very, very different in terms of the data it's uh, going to be dealing with is the Unpath Waters project. Um, and maritime data, as I'm sure you're aware, is a very diverse set of data. So we have a lot of um, spatial data, uh, documentation, artifacts, images, a whole lot of remote sensing and survey data of different kinds. And then the project will also be looking at how to um, create visualizations to um, attract and involve the public in a subject they're incredibly interested in, but data that can be a bit uh, challenging. So huge variety of what the, what the projects are tackling. But looking forward, essentially, the, the five years of funding we have are to undertake a whole period of research and development that will allow us to pull together a set of policy recommendations for how we think the collections of the UK could most usefully um, create some kind of infrastructure that allows the public and researchers to search across collections. So we're hoping this, this issue will be dealt with in each of our discovery projects. They will come up with ways of doing this. But what we're looking at is how, how we scale that up, how we learn from that, and how we essentially recommend it should be taken forward in future. Um, and there is a potential route uh, to funding that future within UKRI's infrastructure funds. We would have to bid for it through the Arts and Humanities Research Council, but that's our kind of end goal is to get funding to um, build a collections infrastructure. This is not at all to take away from the individual infrastructures that collections have, it's how to supplement them and allow an easier searching across multiple collection types. So uh, we have a very um, uh, powerful steering committee who've been discussing these issues uh, and a very knowledgeable scoping group that we've brought together specially to tackle some of these questions. And between them, they've been discussing a whole range of issues. I've just picked out a few here. So what problem are we trying to solve and for whom? Um, I would say I've got a bit of an idea about the problem. It's about how to cross search across multiple different collection types. For whom? The answer at the moment is very simplistic. It's for researchers and the public, but I'll tell you in a minute how we're seeking to refine that. Um, we started off, are we building a single service or a portfolio of services? 
And I think pretty much already we've decided that a single service would be perhaps a bit of a timid response um, and certainly a restrictive response. So we're already starting to think what would be the portfolio of services that would make up this infrastructure. Should it include only open access and equivalently licensed content, i.e. should we make our lives easy or should we be looking to uh, include in it content with all different licensing conditions? Um, that's a biggie. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, how should an infrastructure maximise collaboration? How should everyone work together and get the most from this? And critical, of course, at the sort of design stage is how do we integrate equality, diversity and inclusion and anti-racism practices at the design level? And a massive one where we've learned um, lessons from the past of when things haven't survived. How do we ensure resilience and sustainability? Now, part of that, of course, is funding. Part of that is the strength of partnership. And a lot of it is about the flexibility of what we might build. So in addition to our grant funded research, those discussions between our steering uh, committee and our scoping group have led us to commission a series of um, extra pieces of research that kind of uh, either tackle issues of relevance to all the collections or um, plug gaps between collections. Um, what we've commissioned so far fall into the, the former category. So we have a pair of commissions on uh, copyright and open access. Um, so Art UK have, have pulled us together a report on how they've managed to deal with all the different copyright requirements of art collections across the UK. Uh, we're looking to publish that early next year. Uh, open access, I'll come back to. Digital audit, I'll come back to. And the final grouping is um, on audiences. So the literature review of current online user research is uh, complete and we're just about to publish it. Some of you may well have helped with providing information for that, so thank you very much. Um, but essentially, I would have to say it's found that there isn't a tremendous amount of research out there that provides a tremendous amount of useful data as to how online users use collections specifically. So not just institutional websites, but uh, collections. So it's a very good piece of work, but actually hasn't uncovered a huge amount of uh, data. So we've also commissioned a user consultation exercise. This is being led by the audience agency. It's underway at the moment. And again, some of you might be involved. And this is about trying to establish what people want from a future infrastructure, what they want from collections online, how they want to search, what they want to search for, what kind of interpretation they might want, all, all these issues. Um, uh, they've, got a, they've got a tough job, I have to say. They've got a pretty broad remit. So they're looking at uh, members of the public of different um, levels of interest and connection with collections. And they're also looking at the research community and the stakeholders themselves, so the collections themselves. So very, very keenly looking forward to what they uncover. It won't be until spring next year that we really know, but that's underway. Um, and within the directorate, uh, We've created an international benchmarking report that's just being tidied up at the moment and will be published, uh, I think, in the new year, um, possibly before Christmas, if we're lucky. And um, that was our former senior researcher, uh, Carlotta Paltrinieri, has basically gathered together data from across the world, spoken to various other initiatives. Some of them we invited to come and present in public webinars. You maybe saw some of that to try and understand how other countries um, have been tackling the same issues that we're interested in. And you'll be aware there's a good number of services that do bring together collections and allow cross searching. You'll be aware of Trove in Australia, Japan Search, Culture Italia, Digital New Zealand, uh, DBB, can't quite manage the German on that, but the, the German service. Um, and they're all effective in their way, but from speaking to them, what we know is that they weren't able to undertake a substantial piece of research to underpin what their users wanted and how things could be taken forward in multiple different ways. So they've gone much more straight in to building um, 
a single service that delivers up uh, largely to the public more than to the research community. So you might well find that interesting um, when that comes out shortly. Um, the open access report I'm uh, particularly excited about because I think this is a huge piece of work that Andrea Wallace has done. She's got her teeth right into it. Um, I'm looking forward to having a, a good uh, read and edit of it over Christmas. That's how exciting my life is. Um, and she's basically taking a deep dive into the laws, policies and practices that shape how the public can access and use the UK's cultural heritage collections in digital environments. So you may well be aware of her Open Glam survey that she creates with a colleague that looks across the world. And she's supplemented that very significantly with additional data from 201 UK institutions. So again, thank you if you're involved in providing that data. And her report is seeking to answer the questions, what does open access mean? And what does it enable the public to do with heritage collections? Um, and it seeks to address fundamental misunderstanding of what the public domain is, what it includes and what it should include. And it aims to understand what support is necessary to address systemic barriers to open access starting with copyright. So I think, I imagine I'm not alone in uh, not having a, an incredibly deep knowledge of this area. And Andrea is the expert and we're absolutely delighted that she's um, able to pull this together and we hope it's going to be of pretty fundamental interest across the sector. Um, it doesn't mean that we're going to say that open access is the only way to go in future, but um, we do want to understand it a great deal better. The other large piece of uh, research that I, that I didn't say too much about is the digital audit. So when I started in this job, I sort of assumed we would know uh, what the digital collections of the UK cultural heritage sector comprised of and how much was out there. Um, and it didn't take very long to find out that we really don't know that there isn't any systematic um, reporting of this and that we would need to commission a piece of research to look at it right from the beginning. So we're very pleased Collections Trust and Intelligent Heritage are uh, right up to their elbows in this at the moment. Um, and they're carrying out a survey on the existence, availability and attributes of digitized collections. We've drawn up a list with them of 261 UK GLAM institutions, and they include the independent research organizations, um, members of the National Museum Directors Council, museums within the ACE National Portfolio, designated English collections, recognised Scottish collections, and members of Research Libraries UK. So we think that's where we're going to get the most data in terms of what's out there and how it's used and particularly how it could be made available and uh, link with other collections. But we're keenly aware that that leaves out a huge number of smaller collections. So we've also asked Collections Trust to do an assessment of the capacity of accredited collections. So not, not a full survey, not a full set of interviews, but an assessment of that across that sector um, and this will be informed partly by the COVID project I talked about earlier as to where the capacity um, is there. Now, I'm very aware that probably of everything I've spoken about, people at this event may have been involved in the digital audit. I asked for an update yesterday and essentially I was told you've all been completely fantastic. We've had a huge take up, huge commitment to it. And this is obviously massively important, not just towards national collection, but frankly, for all of us to understand um, the collections that we're dealing with and the kind of state of the nation in terms of um, what's available for the public and for research. So thank you very, very much for uh, anything you've done towards this or any of our studies so far. And uh, I know the deadline is not quite up yet for submitting data. So if you're one of the ones that's uh, promised to complete it, please, please do, because it's very, very important to us. So the big question really is, how do we bring this all together? Um, so we're basically seeing these different planks as feeding the forward thinking. So we're taking everything we're learning from our foundation projects, the COVID-19 projects, and very specifically the discovery projects, 
and they're at such an early stage we can't really say what they how how they're going to feed the future or what they're going to feed it with but it will be hard won experience through what they're developing through their very large multidisciplinary teams and then we've got the commissioned research i showed you what we've commissioned so far we'll probably be commissioning relatively small pieces of research for the next couple of years either to expand on the subjects we've dealt with already or probably more likely to um, fill gaps that appear when we've got a better understanding of what our discovery projects will be doing and uh, we're we're very confident in the team that we're all going to be allowed to travel again next year my confidence is struggling to stay high but that's that's what we're going for and we're aiming to have a workshop for all our discovery projects in february in london and the key aim of that is to get the technical teams together from those projects to really understand what they're all going to try and do and where there are potential overlaps potential complementarity of work where there are opportunities for collaboration and that's where we really will begin to start understanding more about the contribution those projects are going to be able to make to a future infrastructure and then of course we've got this guidance from our uh, steering committee and scoping group and as I said earlier I've got the lovely job of trying to pull all this together and prepare a set of policy recommendations which we'll publish we think that's going to be around early 2024 but uh, it's all very determined by um, spending review cycles and when we think HRC will be able to make a bid for further funding so at the moment we're looking at early 2024 and then that would allow um, a bid to be created and go through the machinations of UKRI and obviously we all hope be successful and allow a whole new phase of work in creating and sustaining a UK digital collections refer research infrastructure. And if you'll allow me to do a little bit of crowdsourcing uh, while I'm here, we really would like a great name for that future infrastructure. So if I've inspired anything in you today and you have any suggestions of what we might call that, um, I would love it to be two words or less. Please pop it in the chat and I will be eternally grateful. So please keep in touch with the programme. Keep an eye on our website. If you've not signed up to our newsletter yet, you can do that on the website. And through the newsletter, we'll be announcing when all of the reports are published, when we're having open webinars to share their results and key activities that are happening within our funded projects. So please do join the mailing list if you're interested in that. If there's anything you want to know from me directly, my email's there. Um, and let me just be put my money where my mouth is when it comes to copyright and uh, let you see the image credits. And I was actually caught out at a previous event where someone wanted to know what one of the gypsy caravans was um, or traveling people's caravans. So uh, luckily I had these notes here and could tell them. Um, I know you can't read them, but just to let you know they're here. So thank you so much for letting me uh, talk to you today. I look forward to receiving your questions. I should probably give a disclaimer. I'm not a technical specialist, a deep digital specialist. So I can tell you about what we're trying to achieve, what our projects are aiming for, who we're doing it for, but I'm not gonna be able to answer really detailed questions about uh, the technical developments, but I can refer you to um, who can answer your questions on that. So thank you very much. I think that's me. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was really interesting. And I'm sure everyone's um, really happy to hear um, a lot more. Um, about such an important initiative for museums and technology um, in the UK. Um, so we've had um, a lot of love for the digital audit in the chat, a lot of excited comments there, um, looking forward um, to seeing the results. And um, we've also had um, a plug from John Stack about the Heritage Connector webinar tomorrow at half past two. So he's posted a link if um, anyone would like to register for that. Um, and um, I'd like to start off the questions myself um, by asking um, how um, institutions that aren't currently involved in one of the discovery projects, um, is there a way that they might be able to get involved um, with the Towards National Collection initiative? 
I think the the main way of getting involved is to take part in the events that either we organise or the projects organise themselves. And that would be an opportunity to both learn what's happening, but also contribute. Um, and particularly, you know, we have got 63 heritage organisations represented. We're very pleased with that. But obviously there's about another three, four thousand out there. So please do sign up to our events and, and make your make your voice heard. There's a possibility that some of the discovery projects might might be might be able to add partners, but I wouldn't like to raise too much expectations on that because their their budgets are already fixed. But if you've got something really interesting to uh, contribute, um, please don't hold back. Great, thank you. Um, and turning to the chat now, um, Sarah Cole has asked, um, is there a ballpark idea for when the open access report will become available? It sounds very interesting. Um, I uh, sent an email to Andrea last night negotiating about who was going to work over Christmas, her or me. So um, we'll, we'll see how that turns out. But I think we've got it down for February publication, but we're still just, as I say, working out who's going to do their bit over Christmas. So. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I'll definitely look out for that. That sounds very interesting. Um, and we've got another question now from Graham Davis, who's asked, how can we ensure that best practice and learning is embedded within collections that aren't part of the main programme going forward? Um, well, again, I would, I would say please come to the, the events because we will be sharing um, a lot of what's going on. We've had a huge amount of events. I saw John plugging, plugging his for tomorrow um, from within the projects and that will grow exponentially now the discovery projects are underway. So there will be a big opportunity to, to learn from what the projects are doing both through events and the reports. Um, and if you've got ideas on how you, you, you know, anything you think we could do additional to that to help embed that learning, then please do get in touch. I'd be very interested to hear that or pop it in the chat and let me know what you think. Okay, thank you. Um, and now um, a question from Mike Ellis. Um, he says, I worry hugely that this is a lot of money being spent on a tiny sliver of audience researchers. Um, can you reassure me that this is actually going to help real, normal, non-researcher audiences and how? Absolutely, Mike. Please don't worry about this. The, the whole purpose of the funding is to be of benefit to both researchers and the public. So nobody has got any money from the programme unless they were addressing both kinds of audiences. Um, and there's all sorts of different ways that's going to happen through the discovery projects. The, uh, the maritime project I showed you has got some work on how to communicate the maritime environment to the visually impaired through soundscapes and whether there's some way of using sonar to do that. So there's some very imaginative uh, stuff going on. Almost all the projects have uh, an element of community collaboration within them. So giving um, different kinds of publics and communities a, a really active voice within the projects and within the developments. I would say the two strongest ones for that are probably um, the congruence engine, looking at the industrial collections through its action research methodology, um, and the uh, our history, our stories, looking at community archives, because obviously that has to be done in collaboration with the creators of those archives. So no, 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 this is absolutely not about any kind of elitist academic researcher audience. They are one of our audiences, but we are very, very interested in how we communicate and involve and listen to the public. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like there's some really exciting um, solutions being talked about um, to address these issues. Um, our next question is from Richard Palmer who says, did the framing of the funding as solving academic research questions mean more immediate GLAM infrastructure or digitization funding was not considered? Or is this work that's intended to be carried out later after there are more findings from the projects? Um, the one decision we did make pretty early was not to include any substantial digitization within the funding because we know, we understand, we know there's a huge need for that, but we also know that you could spend all 18.9 million 
encouraging further digitization and you would have got no further forward on how to connect collections and, and um, increase how they can be understood and used. So that was a tactical decision we took from the beginning. But I think the the, uh, the infrastructure stuff, I would say, is coming through um, the projects, particularly the foundation projects. So I would love to think that some collections are now um, really embracing the use of persistent identifiers, that others are now developing the use of IIIF as a very direct result of those projects, um, helping people to understand that and understand how they could use it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's probably the best I can do. Maybe I could say we're probably not going to be funding digitization in the future, but um, it's coming across loud and clear that it's still an issue. Um, and there are other parts of, infra of HRC infrastructure that may, I don't want to get anyone excited, but that may be able to tackle that issue. We're trying to stay quite strongly focused on bringing collections together. Right, and um, Rupert, Rupert Shepherd asks next, um, when do you think we'll actually have a national collections aggregator in place to replace Culture Grid? Yeah, I'm well aware we're going into a period of void with Culture Grid coming down. Um, I'm afraid it's going to be some time because if we are successful and get future infrastructure funding, that probably wouldn't be coming through until 2025 and then the whole thing would have to be set up. But I would say right now we're not thinking about an aggregator. We're thinking more about federated service. So we're not thinking about straight replacement for the things that have been created, lived for a while and faded away. But interested in people's views on that. Thank you. Um, I had a response from, um, from Mike Ellis, um, who suggests spending the money on cross-sector SEO skills and Wikipedia editing skills um, to achieve greater impact. Is, um, is that something that has perhaps been considered um, in relation to um, some of the projects? Uh, not as far as I'm aware, the first one. The second one, there's uh, several projects that are collaborating with Wikidata and looking at how to use Wikidata as a kind of reference source in the um, linking of collections. Whether that's coming down to Wikipedia editing skills, I'm not very sure, but I know that, um, that Wikipedia in the UK are very interested in working with different collections and supporting the development of skills. Um, so no, at the moment we're not doing that very directly, but we are working in the second area. Right, thank you. And there's been a bit of a discussion going on in the, the comments I can see and um, between Sarah Cole and Mike Ellis about um, the idea of um, open source infrastructures and whether this should be um, sort of one overarching um, infrastructure or whether um, it should be a bit more sort of um, federated, I guess, um, in terms of the different collections that it involves. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that at this point or if it, that's going to be more on the technical side um well i'm interested to know what people think because you know we're absolutely at a stage where um we have a blank piece of paper on this so um no keen to know what people think i saw there was something in the in the chat about why not just call it a national collection perhaps i could um address that uh we think there are problems in that. Now, obviously, we didn't think there were problems when we called it towards the National Collection, but of course, I wasn't in post then, so, so although I was involved through the IROs. Um, and I think the issue is partly to do with whose collections are they? Um, where have they come from? What circumstances have they come into our collections? You know, many of the issues that are that are very um, high on the agenda today. And also obviously the issues of devolution and whether there is any potential um, independence of some of the home nations in future. And it just, um, it just seems to be becoming a bit problematic. So although it works fine at the moment for the development of the program, we're not sure that it's uh, the long-term solution. Yes, absolutely. I can see as well there's um, um, a 
point from Kelly Forbes um, in the chat as well that sort of speaks to that, which is I think it would need to be clear on what national means um, to call it that or to risk excluding people. Oh, I'm glad to see in the chat that um, Daria is here and uh, she's representing the Wikimedia UK who are working with some of the projects. So hopefully, Daria, I haven't uh, <coughs> committed you to anything that doesn't look like it from your from your comments. So. Yes, looking forward to, to hearing from Daria later. Um, I'm just having a look in the chat. So there's a point from Angela Sullivan um, back going back to the discussion on Wikipedia. Um, relying on current open source projects like Wikipedia um, might be a bit of a fool's errand. Um, so open source um, with the future, but it goes beyond structures that we currently have, um, thinking about um, using GitHub and partnerships between heritage and open coding as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an awful lot of discussion to have under the kind of uh, resilience and sustainability um, question that we're dealing with at the moment because you know open source is is a good idea but not if things don't survive and how do you how do you ensure resilience of a of a system through that so i think i would defer to to those who know more about it but it's certainly on the agenda as an issue to consider because the experience of the past and i'm not sure it's to do with open source in the past but people can tell me is about the previous aggregators just having a very limited lifespan um, and we want something that can grow and change and sustain so it's whatever's the best approach to that yeah absolutely and there's a similar comment from kelly forbes as well about putting your data where people already are rather than building a new thing and expecting them to put their data into it yes um well that's what i was suggesting earlier that we're already thinking this is a federated system where we we find ways of of opening access to where the data already is but that's kind of not enough we need to find ways of connecting that data and that's what the discovery projects are really exploring and all of them using ai and machine learning in one way or another so very very keen to see what comes out of that very exciting and um, sarah cole asks are there any big dreams for the outcomes of this project many millions to build it and sustain it that I'm afraid would probably be my big dream. Um, the kind of the examples I give to people, you know, if I, particularly if I'm doing kind of press interviews, are being in, interested in a subject. Um, sitting here in Scotland, say it's golf, and you want to know as a member of the public what's out there in the UK's cultural collections around golf, and you want to know where the hickory clubs are, the aerial photographs of the golf courses the survey data of the archaeological sites on the fringes of the golf courses, the paintings of people playing golf, the archives about how the early clubs were created. You know, you 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 sort of you don't you don't care what kind of material you're looking for, but you're interested in everything around a subject. So it's not a very it's possibly not a very exciting dream, but that's my idea that that something that would be a massive task at the moment, you'd have to know what different collections have to go looking for it. And then you would have to search multiple collections separately rather than having a way in being interested in a subject and finding out everything the UK holds on that subject. Thank you. And um, final question um, from Mercy Sword. Um, are you seeking partners to help audiences co-create using the collections uh, for true reach um, engagement and access, particularly for education? Um, there, there's a decent amount of this happening already or will be happening within the discovery projects. Um, so not at the moment uh, looking for more of that, but um, it rather depends what our audience consultation tells us that people want. And if there's something that they want that we clearly don't know enough about, then there's the possibility then for us to commission more work to understand it better. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And um, thank you to everybody who has been contributing in the chat to make this um, really interesting session. Um, conveniently, now we're moving from towards a national collection to talking about collections. Um, and hearing from three fantastic speakers. So I'm going to hand over now to Mark, who is chairing this session. Thanks again, Rebecca. Thank you.